Hello, I'm Ellen Bitts coming today from Wheaton, Illinois in the USA. Welcome to Impact, a podcast about how we can each bring about real change in the world and getting practical in making that happen. And hello, I'm Clive Johnson coming today from Leon C in the UK. A special welcome if you're listening for the first time and a big thank you to our new subscribers. Each week, we look at one aspect of how we can connect our hearts to offer healing for others with our collective intention, prayers, and meditation, and go behind the headlines of a critical happening in our world that needs our attention right now. In today's episode, we take one of these regular deep dives to more fully understand and tune in with something many of us may know only a little about and see where we might hone in with our prayers and intentions. And as we record, it's September 4th, 2024. Mm. Wow. <laughs> quarter. No, we're not quite quite in the final quarter yet, are we? We're still selling quarter three. And I would like to say happy birthday to my third child, oh. Sophia Muge. And she and her husband listen to our podcast. So oh, happy, happy birthday, birthday, Sophie. Happy happy yes. birthday. Yes. <laughs> Wow. Birthday mentions. Why not? <laughs> Actually, it was my aunt's birthday a couple of days ago, who I think also listens in. Vera in Australia, in Cairns, 94. Wow. Yeah. And Wonderful. she's doing incredibly well. Incredibly. Wonderful. Mm. So this week, we continue our reflections on the power of the collective, a passion of mine. That is our ability in joining together to have an exponential impact when we are praying or sending intention. In this second part of our exploration, we delve into some of the science behind what's going on. And as we mentioned before, research in this field is very much evolving and is increasingly providing insights into the how and why of intention. And I find it incredibly exciting. Yeah. As we mentioned in the previous episode, there are a number of organizations that have been especially prominent in this research. And we mentioned the work of Lynn McTaggart and her associates, including the late American parapsychologist, Dr. William Browd, and institutions such as the University of California and Penn State. We also spoke about the extensive research undertaken by the Heart Math Institute and the Institute of Noetic Sciences, or IONS. And we might also refer to the work of Baylor University in cooperation with the Legacy Labyrinth Project and World Labyrinth Day and its Big Connection Project, as well as research into the effects of collective meditation by the Transcendental Meditation Movement. Links for all of these are in our show notes. So where might we begin to explore what for many of us may be quite a perplexing topic, including the quantum physicists themselves, right? <laughs> Not all of us are quantum physicists after all, but there are some principles that we might perhaps use to get a handle on some of the thinking of those who are. So this might be a bit of a ride for some of us who struggle with some of these concepts. We're going to try and keep things simple and where, where is possible that this always analogies and illustrations help explain some of these things. But bear with us. Particles and waves, first of all, let's talk about what they're about. Useful starting point. Particles and waves were very much distinguished by so-called classical physicists. And we use this term here, classical physics, to refer generally to theories that were developed before the last century and which usually can precisely predict the future state of something that's been subject to particular conditions. So can be tested in a laboratory fairly reliably. And in this classical physics, particles and waves are distinct concepts having different properties and behaviors. Particles have mass, they occupy a specific location in space at any given time. They follow a well-defined path and they can collide with other particles and exchange uh, momentum with them while at the same time maintaining their overall total momentum. Waves, on the other hand, have energy that's spread out continuously in space and time 
and can undergo both constructive and what's called destructive interference. They may spread out. The physicists call this diffracting when passing through openings or around obstacles. So we might think of a sound wave as it goes around a, the edge of a door, for example. I was hearing the phone ring earlier and it's <laughs> rather annoying me, even though the door was more or less closed. So, um, or water waves. Water waves, around. exactly. Maybe if you think in a lake of stone, the waves go around. That's a, yeah, yeah, that's a perfect, perfect picture. So in, in classical physics, these concepts, part of particles and waves, are mutually exclusive. A particle cannot display wave-like properties such as interference, whereas a wave doesn't have a definite position or mass like a particle. And so there are different approaches used to explain each of these. Particle models being used to describe objects like stars and planets and grains of sand, and wave models for phenomena such as water waves, seismic waves, and sound waves. So considering the nature of waves especially leads us to one important practice that we often speak about when talking about intention work, heart-brain coherence. According to the HeartMath Institute, this occurs when our body systems, our breathing, heart rhythms, brain rhythms, and hormonal response are all in sync with each other. Mm. Let's go back and explain. Coherent waves are waves that have the same frequency, same wavelength, and a constant phase difference. This means that they are fully in sync in terms of the number of crests and troughs of a wave that pass a point in a unit of time and the wave's height. It might help to picture an ocean wave when thinking about such things. For a sound wave, to take another image, we might be able to conceptualize the height would equate to loudness. It'd be nice if we could show you a picture right now of equidistance waves, you know, going mm. up. So you can all you can all visualize that. Up and down, isn't it? Undulating. Yes. Parallel from each other. Waves that are parallel from each other consistently. Mm. Incoherent waves are a mess. They, you know, just are all messy together. Like a bundle of string that's got knotted up. Yes. Yes. <laughs> We might also talk about sympathetic resonance, which is where what is in harmony with a certain vibration will resonate with it. I'm going to say that again. What is in harmony with a certain vibration will resonate with it. For example, if a tuning fork used to tune musical instruments of a given frequency is struck and brought into close proximity with another tuning fork, set of the same frequency, the second fork will begin to vibrate in sympathy by emitting the same sound without being struck. This is akin to the way the law of attraction speaks about vibrational alignment, which occurs when the frequency we send out is in harmony with the energy we want to attract. So far, many of us may be able to be open to these concepts. They are ones that can be demonstrated through experiment and in the main conceptualized way. For example, we have described thinking about ocean waves and sound waves. However, we may need to begin to trust what physicists tell us when we get into the realm of quantum physics. Mm. And apologies for some of these terms here. We, we thought we'd mention them because from time to time they, they do come up when, when uh, we're talking about intention work. But perhaps some of the concepts rather than the names behind them are really what, what matter here. So Which will be really cool knowing these words. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> the, actually, they're, they're, a lot of them are very logical, aren't they? We're talking it about is. It's logical when you, yeah. yes, yes. And sympathetic resonance and so on. Mm -hmm. they, they, they actually do describe something that quite a few of us probably can relate to. So what about the teachings of quantum physics? So while classical physics deals with things that in the main follow logical rules, quantum physics throws away that particular rule book, teaching that everything in the universe is made out of and radiates immaterial energy. And that includes every single molecule in our bodies. Quantum physics offers a completely different way of viewing the world to classical physics. 
and shows phenomena that appear to be impossible. Or that they don't understand yet. Yeah, exactly. This kind mm-hmm. of defying, defies the logic that we have. Mm-hmm. And these very often are things that can't be measured or even very easily conceptualized in the way we were talking about a waterway, for example. So we have concepts such as entanglement, which is where two entities, and and to keep this simple, let's just say two individual cells can become entangled. In other words, one behaves directly in harmony with the action of another, even though they may be separated by absolutely immense distances. That is, unless there is something to interrupt that connection. So we thought we'd try and tease out some of these more common, if difficult to understand concepts, and and again, some of the terminology, and see what they can teach us. So let's go back to waves and particles. Here, the quantum physics concept of wave-particle duality holds that Quantum entities, those are tiny, tiny, tiny little entities, exhibit both particle and wave properties, depending on what experiment is being carried out. I find this totally exciting. I don't Mm -hmm. know why, but I love this. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So this contradicts the classical notion that something must be either a wave or a particle, but not both. In wave-particle duality, energy is quantized in discrete packets known as quanta, and particles can be found in certain discrete energy states. So the experiment that they did, that they were as surprised, they were doing a diffraction experiment where, where particles were supposed to go either way, and they realized that the particles turned into waves. <laughs> and they, they were shocked. And when you think about this on a level of mass and what mass actually is when you get down to the quanta level, it's really, really interesting. And the Mm. possibilities begin to pop up in your head. Mm. What's more, whereas classical physics assumes that objects are only influenced by their immediate surroundings and that effects cannot precede causes, Wave-particle duality says that particles can be correlated over large distances instantaneously, faster than the speed of light, I might note. Mm. And the outcome of a measurement in an experiment can seem to affect the past state of a particle. No wonder that Einstein (laughs) described these observations as spooky actions at a distance. And he didn't believe it at first. He wasn't, he wasn't a believer. It took him a while, several years, before he accepted this concept. It's, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Just, yeah. What it must have been like, you know, to, to be Einstein or one of those classical physicists, or who, who'd grown up with classical physics, I should say, and observing this, this throwing out the rule book. My goodness. Yes. So back to quantum entanglement. This phenomenon of wave-particle duality takes us neatly here. And this might have something to say about this nature of intention holding when we work over a distance, might not be over light years distance, might, but we you know, very often will be holding intention for someone potentially on the other side of the world to, to where we are. In physics, entanglement occurs where, as we've said, two particles are connected with one affecting the other, even though they may be quite literally light years apart. In other words, when they are non-local, to use the scientist term, and they can't be separated, as we've said, unless there is some external influence. The Harvard astrophysicist Bob Doyle distinguishes non-locality and entanglement in the the following way. He says that non-locality is a property of a single quantum of light, whereas entanglement is a joint property of two quantum particles, depending on an even more subtle property called non-separability. So one implication of this may be that what we radiate from the heart and mind can influence and become synchronized with any life form that has energy anywhere in the universe and at any time in history. That's quite a thought, isn't it? 
It's it's kind of the basis of the phrase, we're all connected. Yes, absolutely. And some researchers are now exploring entanglement between people, particularly in relation to complementary medicine and healing here. Among those who believe that interhuman healing is possible, some hold to more of a classical physics theory, maintaining that any healing that occurs is mediated by the electromagnetic radiation emitted by the sender. This involves a signal exchange between two people, much like a a radio wave, but which also exerts a force on the receiver by virtue of the body's sensitivity to changes in electromagnetic radiation. Those who turn to quantum physics, on the other hand, finding insight into this person-to-person healing, favor various theories, of which two are most popular. The theory of emergent entanglement corresponds to this theory we've been talking about, quantum entanglement, assuming that there is an additional so-called emergent factor that comes into play when entanglement affects an entire system. In other words, when we're talking about billions of particles becoming uh, entangled rather than just one or a very few. And there's a, a further popular alternative theory called the theory of generalized entanglement, which assumes that when certain unknown conditions are met, entanglement can occur at this macro system level, which might be at the level of a, a human being, for example, as well as at the very tiny micro level. While conceptual mathematics like, and we won't go into this because I, for one, don't know anything about it, quantum mm-hmm. mechanics theory and supports the idea of generalized entanglement. Both theories of human entanglement so far lack support from research, from empirical evidence. And so they, they appear very difficult to study or prove through experimentation. But that's kind of us, impact community. You know, the mm-hmm. macro entanglement is what we're talking about. Yeah. Exactly. In human entanglement theory, a further distinction can be made between the specific entanglement hypothesis and the global entanglement hypothesis. The first proposes that information is exchanged as entanglement occurs between the healer, patient, and some other medium, such as a crystal or remedy. In global entanglement theory, Entanglement between a healer and patient occurs within a system in which they have a mutual awareness and are both a part. Notably, both are aware of the intention for healing to occur. That's a little complicated to understand, Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Psychologist Michael E. Hyland says that global entanglement theory is a way of reflecting the idea that the therapist and patient, plus in some cases a remedy, are not the only aspects involved in the process of entanglement, but there is also something else. And notes that therapists, and not just healers, often report that during the process of therapy, they feel connected to something else. Exactly what this something else is remains unclear. And terms such as universe, God, energy, or even less commonly in the case of spiritism, a spirit are sometimes used. In entanglement theory, therefore, we're brought back to considering that we may impact each other isn't, or at least can't yet, be explained by science alone. Perhaps, though, one scientist had grasped one aspect of the mystery when he observed that Quantum physics reveals a basic oneness of the universe. This was the Austrian-Irish physicist Erwin Schrödinger, who's perhaps best known for his thought experiment that's commonly referred to as Schrödinger's cat. The idea that tiny particles can be in two states simultaneously, and it's not confirmed which they are until they are observed. So that if you can, there's a ton of YouTube videos mm, about Schrodinger's mm, cat and mm, mm. ways to easily explain it. It's very interesting. Yeah. It's one of the key concepts, isn't it? Really? Yes. Yeah. That reality doesn't exist until it's observed. Mm. It's kind of like our observation of what's happening is what if they, I, I heard once analogy to jello. Do you have jello? We don't call it jello. Jello that you eat? Gelatin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, gelatin. Yeah. 
So you have this, this liquid that doesn't get set until things are observed, until you observe it. Yeah. That's the way I heard it explained. Yeah. So there are endless possibilities until you observe the situation. Mm. Moving on <laughs> to another concept from quantum physics that seems especially relevant to what's happening when we send intention is entrainment. And this is the phenomenon where two or more independent rhythmic processes synchronize with each other. So here, two oscillating systems align both their periods and phases. I'm thinking of an old grandfather clock, you know, those swinging pendulums kind of thing. Or the tuning fork. Or the Which tuning happens, fork. You know, when the tuning forks come into phases together. A absolutely. Absolutely. So it's something that you can demonstrate if you've got <laughs> access mm -hmm. to tuning fork. Mm -hmm. So the oscillating systems align both their periods and phases after firstly being independent of each other. So to be able to achieve this, they must be able to influence each other. And that's typically thought to be through physical or chemical means. The effect is seen, and here perhaps the chemical plays a part, in biological systems, for example, where cells can synchronize their rhythms through selected factors, especially as cell density increases, and where biological clocks entrain to external periodic rhythms. So one example of entrainment that we mentioned already is heart-brain coherence. And in order for a group's thinking to be synchronized, such as is key when we're holding intention, it's obviously important that members of the group, in other words, in our community, each of us can allow time to connect with an intention and share a common understanding of it. And that entrainment becomes even stronger when we connect with each other and we become entrained with each other. So for instance, when I do a workshop, the entrainment piece is really important because you first have to get yourself into coherence before you can become a coherent group. And by caring for each other and opening your hearts and vulnerability, compassion, empathy for each other, that's where our hearts become entrained. And we know this intuitively right? We're just explaining it in a scientific way and understanding the power that is held in that entrainment. Absolutely. Now, there's an experiment that I refer to often called the Maharishi effect, and there is some controversy about it in academia. And this refers to a phenomenon proposed by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the spiritual guru who popularized transcendental meditation in the West, in which he says that when a small proportion of a population practices transcendental meditation, sometimes called TM, typically around 1% of that population, it produces positive changes in the larger society. And if you have high-level meditators, I think it's a square root of 1% that, oh, can, wow. mm. that can tip this change. And to put this into numbers, if you have 900 people, 1% of that is 9, mm. and the square root is 3. Right. So three people have the power, if they are entrained and in meditation, to affect 900. The effect is said to work through a field effect of consciousness where meditators influence the collective consciousness of society. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi postulated that there is a fundamental level of consciousness, transcendental consciousness, which lies at the basis of each individual's mind and which is a source of thought located beyond the subtlest level of mental activity. Just as each individual determines thoughts and behaviors are guided by their own consciousness, so the theory goes, is there another type of consciousness in society as a whole, a collective consciousness that has its own potential to influence the mood and direction of a society? This is so exciting. Mm -hmm. When many people feel stressed, for example, they create increased stress in the collective consciousness. Conversely, those who radiate peace impact the collective consciousness in a positive way. 
And this, I feel, is my life's work and passion to teach people about this. So I I get louder and faster when I talk about this. <laughs> In an article published by the Maharishi Vedic Research Institute, authored by the Institute's researchers, David Orm Johnson and Lee Ferguson, a direct experience of transcendental consciousness is an experience of the unified field of nature's intelligence. Extensive empirical research has demonstrated that individuals experiencing transcendental consciousness through the TM and SIDHI program create coherence in not only their own brain in the form of brainwave synchrony and coherence, but in the wider society as well in the form of harmony, order, and peacefulness. They go on to say, as it is with light and electricity, so may it be with life. The phenomena may be individuals carrying on separate existences in space and time, while in the deeper reality beyond space and time, we may all be members of one body. Extraordinary, isn't it? Thank you. Yes. But again, that is a concept that has its roots in innovators. And this I think it's one of the things that, as with you, Ellen, I, 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 one of my real interests was peaked, I guess, it's, it's over 10 years ago now, at a time when I was really inquiring in, into my own spiritual path. And I was learning a lot about different faith traditions. I was particularly drawing on the teachings of the Vedas and, and Buddhist teaching at that time. But I was also at the same time very interested in popular science and <laughs> quantum physics. And when you start to realize, my goodness, these a lot of a lot of what's being described is overlapping, albeit with different absolutely terms. that becomes very, very exciting. And when scientists, which ultimately included Einstein, I know one actually speaking in London tonight, Ravi Ravindra, who was a, a physicist at Princeton, but is also a professor in comparative religion. <laughs> Love it. So he's got got the two sides there. You know, they, they've really become open to this. They've really said, look, we, we are dealing with something bigger than we understand. And of course, that's one of the big drives, isn't it, in science, is for the theory of everything, really. Well, I think it excites me because we intuitively know a lot of this. Yeah. We know we're all connected. Yeah. We know we, got- we have when we come together. But this scientific exploration and explanation helps us understand how powerful that can be and what the possibilities are if we truly use it. And and we're not crazy when we feel that Mm. special feeling of collective effervescence at a sporting event. It is energy. Yes, yes. Or indeed, as just mentioned here, that there are places that feel that they have perhaps a very negative energy. Perhaps that's a collective memory. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I I am a TM practitioner. I went through the training well, quite some years ago now, and I do love and have valued a lot of what Maharishi has taught. So I, I think probably I I'm more intuiting. <laughs> it seems right than you know relying on empirical research and so on. But he taught that when we raise our own consciousness by creating greater coherence in terms of our brain physiology, as is what happens when we meditate, we positively influence the coherence of the collective consciousness. And we could go on here to start talking about Jungian thoughts, couldn't we? But yes. <laughs> that's yes. definitely but I just <laughs> I yeah, I just read a meme or something yesterday that said, you know, knowing this that we're all connected, the universal field, the collective consciousness. However, there are so many different phrases for it. Mm-hmm. When you're feeling like the world is a little bit of a crazy place, remembering that we're all connected and we're all part of the same field, anything you do that raises the field, any kind act, no matter how small or big, it's going to have an impact on that situation that you're you're concerned about. So everything we do has an effect on the, the collective field. And that's a little hopeful. It is. It's what we believe, isn't it? That we we mm-hmm. really can have have a difference, and and ultimately that that can be at a at a macro level, at the level of right. society as a whole. As, as as you were saying earlier, three people in nine hundred—that's significant. Yes. 
Not to mention the detail here, but but certainly the Maharishi Institute has carried out studies, particularly around what happened in quite a large number of US cities yes. to crime rates when there was very focused meditation going on mm-hmm. and drew some very strong correlations there. And it struck me that the TM movement, because it is such a large movement, there are well, I'm one of them, but there are millions of, of mm-hmm. people who are practicing TM around the world. The collectively, that group is a very obvious set of guinea pigs for <laughs> this kind of study, isn't it? Yes. But it- the interesting thing I find about the Maharishi effect, the the studies that they did, especially in the United States, but they they also did them in Israel too, didn't they? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I believe so. Yes. A while ago, and so yep. this. The, the some of the controversy about these studies is the question of whether intention should have been introduced or not and so there was a collective intention and it was not you know they the, these people were meditating mm. and they were probably entrained and you know coherent yes absolutely but they did not give them a specific intention Lynn McTaggart's work about intention came years later after these experiments. Mm. So now we are combining entrainment with intention, and that creates an an exponential factor that wasn't considered in the Maharishi effect. Mm. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And talking of experiments that are going on at the moment, you you are very actively involved, aren't you, Ellen, in the Labyrinth Activist Network in uh, research starting from the day of our recording tomorrow. Yes. Yes, I'm very proud. I am the director of the Labyrinth Activist Network for the Legacy Labyrinth Project. And I'm also the World Labyrinth Day Coordinator. So I was able to kind of put together some research. At, well, Chris Katzenmeyer, the director, did everything about this research. I just said, hey, what if we did this on World Labyrinth Day? That's all I did. And we have found some interesting things using the labyrinth and intention and entrainment. And tomorrow, on September 5th, we will be getting a beginning a six-week series on peaceful and free elections, intending for the highest good of the ability for people to vote peacefully and elections to remain peaceful because this year in 2024, nearly half of the world's population will be involved in some kind of a vote for democracy. Mm -hmm. As I'm sure all of our listeners know here in the U.S., it's heating up. And I know in other places in the world, there are elections soon. You just had your election on July 4th. And luckily, things remained peaceful right? Yes. But there are places where, you know, elections can be violent and people are prohibited from voting and that kind of thing happens. So our intention is for the highest good. It's not a political statement. It is to hold the energy above all this and to raise the vibration so that there can be peaceful outcomes. We'd love to have anyone join us. Go to the LegacyLabyrinthProject.org to sign up if you'd like to join. Even if you're listening to this after September 5th, you have until September 19th Uh to join. You can miss the first meeting. But interestingly, (laughs) we are closing it after September 19th because of the concept of entrainment and our circle. And we want to become Uh entrained and become powerful. And so, you know, we will work on that after the second meeting and it it's being seriously studied isn't it with Bay- baylor university uh, yes yes baylor research. university is is cre- is conducting research during this whole thing and each participant will have some short evaluations to fill out each time we gather together nothing nothing intense for the participant but will be very informative to the researchers mm. of how we and, and and they're studying how we become entrained And as our group becomes more and more powerful over these six weeks, and we've done this before in a beta testing, and the the outcome was really incredible beyond what we thought would happen. And now we're doing it in a a full force, six-week way. 
All right. I mean, it's, it's meeting way. It's more, yeah. it's, it's more like 12 weeks. So it's going to be interesting and I'll report back. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Out. Definitely. Definitely. We will we'll, uh, be very interested to mm -hmm. keep uh, up on that story and absolutely. We'll put the link in the show notes, obviously, if yeah. folks want to get involved in what I think is very important work. Very, very important work. I think it will be important. Yeah, yeah. And potentially uh, really important research contributing to this this whole field. Now, we thought we mentioned too, not so much a scientific concept here, but it seemed to fit in with this <laughs> slightly unusual episode we're doing today. Another important uh, idea that we shouldn't neglect to mention is the idea of collective effervescence. I love this term. Yes. Now, this actually comes from sociology. And it was the early 20th century sociologist, very well-known sociologist, Emil Durkheim, which who coined this phrase, I believe, which describes a state of intense, synchronized emotion and a sense of unity shared by individuals at large-scale gatherings and rituals. In this state, participants experience a feeling of losing their individual identity and merging with the group even coordinating their movements and gestures. And that doesn't have to be a sort of stage Mexican wave. It's something that's happening naturally. Mm -hmm. And feeling something, feeling this connection to something larger than themselves. So a phenomenon probably many of us might have experienced at music festivals and sporting events, for example. Yeah, like when your team scores and everybody stands up and... <laughs> You, you know, if you're walking out of the stadium and you hear that roar and you can feel it, yeah, it's an energy and it comes instantaneously from from each of us. Right. And we all stand up and yell. And, and what we're I, talking I don't think you can invent it either. I I, I had a, a sense of this myself recently. I was very, very blessed, very fortunate. I, I went to the Olympics in Paris just just for a day, a, a month or so back now, and lucky. I was I was very very lucky, but I I, I it was my second Olympics I've been to. The, the other was London, and inevitably I compared. I don't know why, but I did not have the same sense of collective effervescence in Paris. It was not there. Oh, uh, and the staging was very very similar. You know, there were there was there were MCs working up the crowd. There was a lot of excitement, people cheering on their teams and other teams as well. But I did not feel that. What I did feel was th that real immediate sense of beyond what beyond anything that was going on in me, really, a real connection. When I was waiting to get the train at St Pancras, the, the train London London railway station, where you get the train to Paris, and out came. A group of athletes representing Team GB, and they were Eurostar. The the train company was leading them onto the train. And said, "Please show up, applause or whatever for <laughs> athletes on their way to Paris." And everybody got up, but it wasn't just the applause. Of course, it was this immediate sense of I can't even describe the feeling. Yeah, it was there for a matter of moments, perhaps real. Joy. And it wasn't pride or anything like that, particularly. Yeah, that is something that you cannot force. You cannot no. stage. <laughs> As I no, say, and we know that in ourselves. Like I no. think we know the authenticity of it. E exactly. And, and there I was in so powerful. A few hours later in the Stade de France and you know, whatever that is, seventy thousand seater stadium, and it wasn't there. <laughs> strange. Um, Very strange. Very interesting. Yeah. Now, Durkheim actually contended, I love this as well, that Homo sapiens is Homo duplex. That is a creature that lives on two levels, perhaps even more than two, we might assume, having both an individual and an individual aspect of ourselves and a part in the broader society. So when we take part in a ceremony or a big sporting event, for example, we realize that each of us is there, both as an individual, but also as part of a collective. And in such circumstances, we may perceive that we share emotions with others, reinforcing this collective identity. And I think it goes beyond this. I don't think it's so much mm -hmm. about what's going on in the brain, or I identify with this, and I'm empathizing with what's going with others. It's happening spontaneously. The result is that we become less self-absorbed than we might normally be, 
and essentially transcend ourselves. And of course, this is what Maharishi talks about a lot, of course, <laughs> when we meditate. This phenomenon of collective effervescence has been studied and explained scientifically in various ways, including high-level meta-studies of correlations between collective effervescence and various outcomes. However, there are still quite a lot of gaps in the scientific understanding of what is actually going on and specifically what causes this, even if it's something that's regularly observed. And as I say, I, I think most of us perhaps can can remember occasions when we've perhaps experienced it. Mm -hmm. but perhaps it's been another area to get excited about where we might possibly learn something more in the coming years. And I think we would be remiss to not talk a little bit about the Heart Math Institute and the concept of the electromagnetic fields that emanate from our heart. Yeah. And so that's how we become coherent and entrained with each other. I highly re recommend listeners to visit HearthMath Heart Math Institute's website because they've done some very interesting research, one of them being where three people are coherent in a room and someone comes in who is not coherent, maybe agitated. And in a very short time, their heartbeat starts to become in sync with the other three, showing the effect that we can have on other people. And as we become coherent, our magnetic field becomes larger. And that's what we're talking about with the you know, Maharishi effect and how mm. we can affect others. Mm. It, extend, it literally extends further from our bodies. This isn't metaphorical. This is literal. The, mm. the magnetic field literally extends farther from our body to show the effect you can have on others and bring others into coherence. Or others can try and bring you out of coherence, too. Mm. So it's important to you know, stay centered. So it's not actually our purpose today to relate what we've been discussing, the, the physics, to those who, well, for those of us who follow a spiritual tradition, what we might believe. But we are struck by the seemingly big overlap between what particularly quantum physics is teaching and what the sages and scriptures of many traditions have spoken about for millennia. In many traditions, receiving spirit, divine breath, or an energy that's imbued with wisdom, creative and healing power, and is something that transcends human concepts of time and space, is something that many of us you know, who follow a tradition would relate to, and, and not only relate to it, but actually experience for ourselves. Similarly, many will relate to ideas such as the collective unconsciousness, the idea of a universal field, or simply knowing that in different times and places, such as being when as we're saying at a, a football match, for example, or being stirred by the voice of an opera singer, there is this sense of oneness and connection that seems to go beyond ourselves. So in short, even though we don't fully understand the science, we might accept that there appear to be few contradictions between what science is revealing and what we instinctively believe about sending intention. And by the way, if you do want to look into some of these concepts more, we have listed a number of websites, including the likes of the Harm Math Institute and its research, and several other sources that provide what we believe are fairly accessible for non-physicists, non-scientists, and that certainly includes me, <laughs> uh, to, to, to look at in the show notes. So from our discussion today, where might we go with an intention focus for this week? And the Heart Math Institute has coined a phrase that I love, energetic responsibility. The duty we each have to recognize that our thoughts, attitudes, and emotions emit energies that impact not only ourselves, but others around us, as I just explained, and to consciously choose positive emotions like appreciation, care, love, and they say the highest emotion, one of the highest emotions is compassion. Mm. And of course, love. Love has power. If you don't remember anything from today, please remember that the coherent energy love is powerful. As we open ourselves to these mysteries and wonders of quantum science and 
Become excited at the new discoveries that are enhancing human understanding. Let us redouble our belief in the power of intention and intercession and commit ourselves to take our own energetic responsibility seriously. For our specific focus for intention this week, we suggest we will that each of us in the impact community will be mindful of our energetic power and exercise responsibility for this in all circumstances. Please join us in holding this. We can make a difference. We say every week. That about wraps it up for today. Remember, you can connect with us in the Facebook group and for live intention holding in My Daily Insight Time Offerings and with Ellen in the Labyrinth Activist Network's Zoom calls. And don't forget that you can still register for the free elections event, which is going on. Useful and free elections. Useful and free elections. We have that and details of how to find us on Inside Time and elsewhere in our show notes. Look out, too, for our next special topic episode, which we'll be releasing in the next few days. Thank you for listening and for sharing with us in Holding Intentions. We look forward to connecting again next time. And in the meantime, thank you, go well, stay safe. And remember, we're more powerful together. Impact is presented by Ellen Mintz and Clive Johnson and produced by Impact Productions. Our theme music is by Chris Collins and our logo artwork is by Auto Classic. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audible or your favorite podcast provider. We're a non-commercial podcast dedicated to people of any faith tradition or none who yearn for healing in our troubled world. Please pass on the word so others may join us in making an impact. Thank you for listening.